second talk of the day, if you attended the first talk of the day. Raise your hand if you attended the first talk of the day. Okay, congratulate yourselves. Good job. Nice work. Thank you, Ferret. Okay. All right. So uh, let's get at least slightly started here for a minute. Um, but before we get too far, here's the deal, is I like to capture every moment I can. So I'm going to need you all to like scoot in for a minute so I can take a picture with you all. I'm going to burn a little bit of time. So I'm going to need you guys to slide in this way. I need you all to slide in that way. Get comfortable. We're all attendees. We all know each other loosely. Okay, and you're, we're going to have a, oh, we're going to get a photo together. So come on, hurry. I only got 40 minutes, y'all. Come on, here we go. <laughs> only 40 minutes, okay? And give me your most excited energy. Ready? All right, ready? And go. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Keep going. Yeah, that was good. That's, look how excited we are. All right, that's good. Don't go back to your seat. You can stay right where you're at. Well, I didn't trick you. I'm just saying you can. It's okay. You won't need your laptop. Trust me. You won't even need a pa uh, pad of paper and notes. I mean, these are all being recorded anyway, so you're in luck. Okay, so to get some formalities out of the way, my name is Adam Cuppy. I work for a company called Zeal. We're a web and mobile applications consultancy. We work with a lot of teams all over the country, and many of those teams have less experienced engineers and what we would classify as maybe senior level engineers. And we work with a lot of interns and apprentices. And in that time, I discovered a few things that were common amongst the ones that had less experience with ones that had more experience. Now. Um, so, that's what this is about. So, we're going to talk about confidence. And I'm assuming you probably read uh, what this was going to be called, mechanically confident. I'll get into that here in a little bit. But before we get too far, you know, this is generally when we think about confidence, what happens is, you know, step one, believe in yourself, right? Step two, you're confident now, right? That's like the, the, the basic mechanics of it is, number one, just believe it. And I kind of didn't really love this. And I don't know if you're anything like me, but I kind of felt this way, kind of like, you know, go fuck yourself. <laughs> just a little bit, right? That there was more to confidence than just simply believing in it. Now, I've been an actor for 20 years, longer than I've been a software developer. And there's one question I get asked more than any other question, and that is, do you get stage fright? And the answer is every time, but it doesn't matter. Because there's things that we do to make sure that the moment we take that foot onto the stage, all that kind of confidence, that ingrained ability just kicks in. And we're going to talk about exactly that. OK. So the thing that, is, uh, that I want to talk about first, though, is conscious confidence. And conscious confidence is the one that you think about, right? This is the one that you're aware of. Oh, and, and most of us can experience this you know, multiple times in our life, some things that are small or, or, or less, uh, less overly relevant to the rest of our day, and then other things that are much bigger. But conscious confidence, again, is the thing that you think about, right? Um, and, you know, there's certain things I'm really good at, but then there's other things that I don't necessarily believe in. So I don't know if about you, but I want you to raise your hand is, uh, how many of you have been driving a car for longer than a year? Raise your hand if you've driven a car more than a year. OK, how about five years? Keep your hand up if you've driven a car for more than five years. 10 years? 20 years. OK, so many of us have driven a car a lot, right? And so we're familiar with this layout. Right? We've got a wheel and navigation, what have you, if you've got one of the fancier ones. Well, this last week, I had this cool opportunity. I was speaking at Isle of Ruby. Just got off the plane, actually, late last night, right? Very long trip, um, where things are just a little different, right? I don't know if, about you, but if, <laughs> whenever, when I had this moment, I was traveling with my family. My mother and father and my wife were with us. We were traveling, and we're like, OK, we're going to drive a little ways up north. And when we do, we're, you know, we're going to rent a car. And the moment this had happened, right, we we're like, OK, we're going to have to get on the other side of the car. And it's like, oh, I've got to drive. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, shit, oh, shit, oh, shit. I mean, the whole time, I am freaking out, right, that I'm going to have to drive this car. But that's the conscious mind, right? That's our conscious confidence. The other side of the confidence, the kind of subconscious, that, that, that underlying confidence was like, hey, it's all good. Think about this for a minute, right? Like, what's different? I'll get back to that here in a second. But first, I want to tell you a story about a, a gentleman named Eugene Polly. Now, Eugene Polly, um, in about the late 60s, uh, was a gentleman that, at the age of 59, had contracted a bacteria that ate away a substantial part of his brain, and more specifically, the part of his brain that controlled short-term memory. So until he died in his 70s, he had no idea he was older than 60 to 90 seconds past the age of 59. No clue. He had grandkids. That, as far as he was aware, he never knew he had until he had met him. And similarly, as he aged, he had no idea he was aging. Really had no clue. 
Now, for the most part, this kind of like ignorance is okay, right? I mean, if you think about it. But let's talk a little bit about what his routine looked like. Every morning, the alarm would uh, wake him up, and he'd walk into the kitchen, make a couple of eggs, some bacon, and toast. He'd eat that, and then head right back to bed for another 15-minute nap or so before he'd get up again. But what would happen? He'd wake up again, walk into the kitchen, make some eggs and bacon. He did this on average about five or six times a day until eventually the sun was high enough in the sky that he kind of was like, whoa, I must have slept in a little bit too long. Now, as he started to age, his family started to notice that there could be some problems with this. And doctors were recommending, you know, like, he can't just eat bacon and eggs every single day and not get at least some exercise. This is going to be a little problematic, right? So what do you do? So every day or so, his wife would take him out on a walk around the neighborhood. And they would walk this path that would take about half an hour, 45 minutes, very leisurely. But it would be an opportunity for him to get some exercise. And they would do this again most days. Now, one day, for some reason, I think she was sick. I can't entirely remember the story, but she wasn't available. She wakes up, and he's gone, freaked out, you know, calling, trying to figure out where he's at, calling neighbors. Nobody knows where he is. And about half an hour, 45 minutes later or so, he shows back up at the front door. What? What? None of that makes any sense. He has no idea where the heck he is. He doesn't even know what happened literally two minutes prior. So... They took him in and was examining this kind of phenomenon of like, how would it be possible this individual has no short-term memory, would have this ability to remember a path that he didn't know prior and never knew any other day. And in fact, if you were to ask him, uh, well, what path did you walk? Not only did he not even remember that he did it in the first place, but he definitely couldn't tell you what it was. Similarly, they had moved during this period of time. And while he could still make it into the kitchen every single day or to the bathroom or even into his own bedroom, he couldn't give you the layout of his house. He couldn't tell you consciously where something was, but his body always knew where it was, and it could always find its way there. Now, unfortunately, again, his daughter and his family was aging. He had grandkids that he never remembered about. And they discovered this real odd thing starting to happen, which was, and it was really quite unfortunate. I mean, just imagine this if you were in this situation. And that is that his, when his daughter would come over, his daughter would leave, and he would get furious. Like, she was just here. She just got here. She didn't even say goodbye. Right? But the weird thing was this, was that he would get more and more frustrated. Like, well, why? Wouldn't it be the same level of frustration? I mean, he didn't remember the time he had had before, but now he's getting more frustrated time and time again. So psychologists in the 60s started to look into this, and what they discovered was this, that the conscious mind, and specifically short-term memory, was controlled by a part of the brain that was totally different from habit and routine. Totally different. That muscle memory and the thing that drives you to know, again, where to go physically when you get into a car, just to how to turn it on and where to drive and gas pedal or what have you, that automatic response that you do every single day, for, for many of you every single day, is something that's done by a totally different center of the brain. However, when we disrupt that pattern, even just for a moment, like the other side of the car, even when that happens, it's as if our conscious mind trips out, flips a table, has no idea what's going on, and tells us, danger, 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 think twice, right? This is the way, and this is the funny mechanics of the mind. So, when we look back at this example, right, and I am, again, I'm in London for the first time with my family. I mean, like, my family, my wife, you know, I don't have kids yet, but, like, the whole idea, like, my whole future is going to be screwed, and it's all responsible to me. Like, my conscious mind is tripping out. And I don't know if you've ever experienced this before, but it's tripping out. Any change at all is tripping out. But then the subconscious mind is like, hey, it's cool. Like, chill out. It's all good. Like, let's think about this for a minute. OK, um, well, what is the same? If things are different, what is the same that we can build off of prior experience? And it's like, well, let's see. Steering wheel, check. Uh, well, uh, dials and gauges, check. In kilometers, though, don't not no check on that one. Uh, oh, gas pedal, check. Uh, brake, mm, check. Well, oh, we've got turn signals and we've got wipers. We've got cruise control. Okay, check. Oh, the weird button you press when you're, you know, double parked, and you want people to know that. Okay, check. But what is different? Oh, that one. Oh, okay. So everything else, for the most part, is the same, except that thing on the left, which. Is that still the same? Oh, well, we still have park and drive and neutral. Or if it's a manual, we still have one, two, three, four, five, or what have you. I mean, all of that's the same. It's just on my left. 
So what happens is instantly in that moment, the body goes through this acclimation process where it's like, hey, it's okay. 80% of what you're familiar with, 90% of what you're familiar with is all the same. There's only a couple things that are different. Now, I don't know about any of you, but I'm particular about a couple of things, right? And some of those things can be things like editors, right? Sometimes color schemes are like really important to me or specific libraries are like really important to me. And then give me just a little bit of time and I, come, I become a little more okay with it. Yeah, this is part of the reason why. Now, back to my story here. So we're about to go driving and our first thing is, well, now we gotta get on the open road. Oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. I mean, it's all, again, like everything is screwed. We gotta figure this out all over. But again, the conscious mind is like freak, freaked out, but the subconscious mind is like, hey, take a step back. It's cool, take a break. What's the same? Well, we're still traveling forward. That's good. Okay, um, let's see. Ah, we still have uh, disasters on the left or on the right. Oh, we have lines that tell us to stay in the, sa in, the, uh, in the right space on the road. Now, what's different is all the dangers coming from the right and not the left. It's the only difference, right? And this is real. This is the thing that our body will consciously acclimate itself to. So once we get into that mode, now I don't know if you've ever had this experience where you're driving either on the left or right and you're switching sides, but I don't know if it was anything like my own, but it was a, a, a period of time where it was really uncomfortable and all of a sudden it became more and more natural and more and more normal, right? Because we're starting to like rebuild this routine. We're rebuilding the idea and we're acclimating ourselves to what is different and what is the same. Then this happened, right? I don't know if you've experienced roundabout, but we don't have a ton of these in the United States uh, in comparison to like they are in Europe, especially not in England. Now, first thing I wanna note is the excessive use of street lights. Um, no idea why there's so many, but there are. Uh, and the signage is really exceptional, almost a little bit too much, but I'll never forget hitting this thing. And the same thing applies, right? I'm freaking out consciously, but then there's that moment of like, but what's the same? And this, again, is what mechanical confidence is all about, right? Like I said, I've been an actor a long time. And I would class, probably be classified as a senior engineer or a senior developer. I've been writing code for about 15 years. But what I've come to realize, again, is that that learning gap, that difference between those with less experience and those with more, rarely has to do with just simply time. And it never has anything to do with intelligence, ever. It has everything to do, in my opinion, with routine and habit. Now what was interesting to me was that while we talk about confidence as the byproduct of belief, which I don't believe it is, that if we can ingrain routine into what we do, and when I started to ask and talk to a lot more engineers that had experience, this was the consistent thing they were doing, was they had simple routines they were following day in and day out, right? Day in and day out they were doing it. Like, so I have an interesting question that I started to ask, which was, how many of you tend, well, let me first ask, how many of you written software, uh, regardless of the language, but written software for five years or more? Okay. So for those of you who have written for five years or more, I, and maybe, maybe less than five years, this is also gonna be true, so I don't mean to just call those individuals out, but I'm curious. Of those of you who have written for multiple years, how many of you tend to lay out your window with the, with certain screens like the terminal and the editor and, and so forth in the exact same way every time, right? Why? Does it really matter? Well, of course it doesn't really matter, but intuitively it does, right? How many of you tend to have preference towards new windows versus tab displays, right? When you're editing, right? Now here's the thing I was discovering was when I was asking and talking to developers that had, some, had less experience, generally they'd have a chaotic sort of environment. Now I'm not saying that's necessarily just a total and leading indicator, because I think some people can be very effective, but generally speaking, what I discovered was it was these basic habits and routines that we start to fall into. And so we started to experiment th with this a little bit. Uh, we had a couple of interns that had joined our company for a period of time. And, and oftentimes they totally knew the answer, but they weren't, they didn't feel confident to like speak up to that answer. And I think there's a lot of factors why. This, it's not just this, there's many other things. But what I started to experiment with was, okay, so here's what I want you to do. All I want you to do for the next week is put the terminal on the left and the editor on the right. That's it, that's all I want you to do. And behind both of those, I want you to put the browser. That's it, full screen, put the browser behind it, terminal on the left, editor to the right. 
You can always change it later. Well, let's just do that for a week and see what happens. And what I discovered was this weird and odd sort of thing, which was slowly but surely, the degree of confidence and certainty about like, oh, like about what was the next step started to emerge. My theory, and there's no science to back this up that I have other than a theory, but that my theory was is that by simply like pulling that out of the mental equation, the cognitive equation, the conscious equation, by simply pulling that out for a moment, it gave me an opportunity to build habit and routine that, that informed me as a developer or informed them as a developer on how to jump through situations, change, and different um, issues. I don't know about you, but especially with Rails, that the moment that I see an error, I almost never need to read it anymore. It's just the pattern of the error is enough for me to figure out what it is. I mean, I can pretty quickly, under, uh, pretty quickly know just by looking at an error without even reading it that there's an end statement missing somewhere, right? I don't know about you. And there's, like, I've used better errors and other tools, and man, when they switch that thing up, it screws me up for a few days, like, every single time. And so, again, try to experiment with this. Now, d was it because the editor was on the right and the terminal was on the left that now they became, you know, far more confident? Well, yes and no, right? Again, it was, it took that and created that habit and that opportunity for them to not have to worry about that anymore so that confidence can build in other very important ways. Now, in researching for this, there was a book that I highly advise to all of you. I really recommend it. It's really, really good, and it's called The Power of Habit. If you've heard of it, uh, great. If you haven't, it's really, really good. It's a great audio book as well. And it was written by a Pulitzer Prize winner, and uh, what he came up with was he was, the story of Eugene Pauly is in it, even in more detail, um, and which was what really drew me into the whole thing in the first place. But what he discovered with the, was that for the sake of habits, whether we, uh, the ones that we form or the ones that we change, there's the same three-part routine. The first is, or the three, part sta or three stages to it, the first is a routine of some sort, right? For many of us, we eat in the morning. For those of us, well, let me ask, how many of you eat breakfast in the morning? Okay, uh, let me ask the opposite of that. How many of you do not eat breakfast in the morning? Okay, you're... <laughs> How many of you eat two breakfasts? <laughs> yes, right. Uh, now here's the thing is the body can survive for a very long time without breakfast in any form, right? Most of us do or don't, not on the basis of whether or not we're hungry, legitimately hungry in our body is in a form of starvation of some kind, but it's because there's a habit around it, right? Um, how many of you take a shower every single day? Every single day, regardless of whether or not you took one the night before, right? Very much a part of the routine. Now, interestingly, there's something I was experimenting with. This is uh, in the biohacking community. Uh, there's a lot of talk about cold therapy, and one of the things they try and introduce is the idea of cold showers. Now, the idea, the sheer concept of a cold shower, is something that most freaks most people out. I've been taking cold showers for about two years now, and in the first like month, it was like a real jarring event. Now, there's a lot of benefit. There's a lot of studies around this, and there's a lot of potential benefits and what have you. And do it or don't, uh, that's less relevant. But what I've discovered is now I can't finish a shower without making it cold, right? And in Pittsburgh, it is really cold, <laughs> like really cold. I'm from San Diego. It is not that cold when you turn it cold. But I can't. And, and if I don't do that one last step, even for a brief moment, like there's a sense of, there's a lack of conclusion that's happening. Now this is, this is more habitual than, bio, uh, than biochemical, right? This is more habitual, but it's a real thing. Same thing, people who might lift weights or work out a lot, there's an addiction that tends to happen, and I think part of that is a very mental thing, right? There's a conscious addiction, but there's also physical addiction as well, and I think also there are things that bake and build around that that say, well, when I either work out or I do something physical, the continued routine of that, I have that routine matters to me, which moves into the second bit, which was reward. That there is some reward on the other side of the routine, whatever that might be. Um, it might be as simple as something like weight loss or a goal that you're making progress towards, or of course, in my case, uh, uh, when it comes to cold showers, I like to punish myself viciously. <laughs> but it could be one of a million different things, right? But routine and reward are the first two steps, and the third is that there is a cue. There is something that cues that off. If we look at breakfast or something, some morning routine, that might simply be that it's the morning, right? I've taken a shower, I've gotten dressed, the next thing within the routine is I'm now gonna eat breakfast or what have you. Out of pure curiosity, when it comes to breakfast, how many of you 
you know, nine out of ten times basically eat the exact same thing. Now keep your hand up if it's not, if you would know consciously that's not always the most healthy thing for you, what you eat every single day. Right. Well, some of you are like, yeah, definitely. Right? Okay? So it's, this is that habit, right? And this is in that book and what he talks about, and I highly advise checking it out. So when it comes to mechanical confidence, the, the question, and I think the, the purpose of this talk is to talk about, well, what do we do about it, right? So how can you create these things? Not just know about them consciously, but what can we do to actually form them and put them into context? Now, again, I was talking about that I was an actor, uh, and so I'm going to talk first about stage fright and improv. Now, uh, you can kind of see the photo, but this is just my, my, one, my one image. So uh, I, this is a show that I did for uh, a theater in San Diego. Uh, the show, you can't really see it, but the show was called A Civil War Christmas. I played 19 different characters. <clears throat> this is a dying soldier. I also played two generals and a horse. So a lot of different characters. At one point during the show, there's one line that has 10 words in it, and I'd go, every two words go to a new character. So it was five characters in 10 words. So the question that I'm often asked is, like, how do you remember that? Like, how could you possibly do that, right? Um, well, I, I will tell you, it's actually quite simple. So I'm going to give you all a quick lesson in how as an actor to create five different characters in 10 words, OK? So here's what I want you to do is I want you to take a moment and stand up for me. Stand up. All right. And what I want you to do is I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to think about either a person in your life or a crazy character, or it doesn't really matter, something really big and audacious, good, bad, or otherwise, big and audacious. I want you to really visualize that individual in your mind. Like, make that a really clear picture in your mind. OK? Now, what I want you to do is I want you to identify a part on your body, a part on your body that you can put all of that attention into, like, let's say your shoulder. And we're going to call this this character's center, that the center of this character is a part of your body. Okay. Now, what I want you to do right now is I want you to really visualize, and I want you to accent that part of your body. Right. So if you want to open your eyes a minute, and I'll show you what I mean by that. So let's say it's a shoulder. I'm going to say like it's their shoulder. Right. They really accent, like push it out as far as you can, whatever it happens to be. Okay. So close your eyes again. I want you to think about this character. I want you to really visualize it. I want you to find that part of the body, wherever it is. It could be one single toe. It could be a hip. It could be your eyeball. It could be your nose. You name it. And I want you to put all of your physical energy into that one part of your body. Okay. Put all your physical energy into that one part of your body. Okay, now what I want you to do is I want you to open your eyes, and I want you to move around the room watching out for everybody's stuff with that as the leader, right? So if you're going to lead from your shoulder, you're going to move around the room. Go ahead and move around the room. It's, go ahead and move your feet. It's OK. Move around the room with that one part. That's right. Accenting that one part of your body, the one part of your body. Just the one part of your body. Sounds crazy, but trust me. OK, now stop. Stop for a second. Close your eyes again. And I want you to visualize an entirely different character, somebody totally different. OK, and do the same thing. Now, for this character, I want you to pick a totally different part of your body. Totally different part of your body. OK? Now, accent. Put all your energy into that part of your body, whatever it is. So if it's your hand, your forehead, your, back, your backside, doesn't matter. Okay. Now I want you to move around the room with that side of your body as the driver. It's OK. We all look crazy and stupid. Don't worry. This is acting. <laughs> OK? All right. Now go back to the first character. Go back to the first character. Use the other part of your body and go back to the first character. OK, now go back to the second character. OK, stop. So here's the deal. Acting 101 is this, which is if you pick a center, you don't have to worry about whether your mind consciously will remember that. So if I say that the character leads from here and the second character leads from there, just simply by physically going into that spot, the conscious mind will pick up on the cue and the body will just take over. So the answer to how do you do five characters in 10 words is you pick a different center for each of the five. And they were all, they happen to be a classroom of I think it was two boys and three girls, I think is what it was. And they were like under the age of 11 or something. I can't, I can't entirely remember. 
But anyway, so it was like pick a different center. Now, the interesting thing was the audience, when they look at that, they think to themselves, oh my gosh, how are you doing? And it's like, no, 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 literally it's shoulder, elbow, hips, left leg, eyes. That's all I got to remember is that. Okay, so go ahead and migrate back to your seat. So I don't know if you, if most of us are familiar with this troop of uh, people. Uh, this is whose line is it anyway? And this is, uh, this was, uh, who is not familiar with whose line is it anyway? Uh, the improv troupe. It's okay. Okay, great. So whose line is an improv troupe that was, uh, they actually currently tour all over the place, right? Um, and uh, they do all sorts of improv. And I don't know if you've ever done improv, but improv is a really fun, fun thing that freaks most people out. Right? Because uh, if you're not familiar, so improv is improvisation, where what will happen in a given scenario, and like these four individuals might be up on a stage, and they say, okay, well, uh, there's an exercise that I want you to do, and uh, here is a line of dialogue you have to integrate, here's a character you have to integrate, and the theme is murder mystery. Go. And on the spot, they have to put something together. Well, here's the thing most people don't realize, is this is some of the most rehearsed theater available, is improv. So kind of like Eugene Pauly, like wh why, would you, why would you rehearse improv? Because what is rehearsed is all of the exercises, all the patterns, all the routines, all of the themes. The only thing they don't know is the content. That's the only difference. So I had a really cool opportunity. I actually got to do a show with them. Uh, this would have been about seven or eight years ago, I think. And uh, Wayne Brady, who's the second gentleman in on the left, he uh, is incredible with music. Like, he can do the most amazing things with musical interludes and themes. Um, but I was actually doing a, sorry, I, met, I jumped by. So, uh, Ryan Stiles is the one on the far left over here with the glasses. Well, I guess they all have glasses. Uh, in the orange shirt. So, Ryan Stiles, I was doing a scene with him. And uh, the scene that we were doing was one where you might have seen the exercise where the, the two of them are doing the dialogue, but there are two other people that are moving them. And so they have to adapt to whatever movement they're being given. So they don't move their own body, in other words, OK? Now, here's what's interesting about it is there is an actual routine that they go through where they are, in fact, encouraging the audience member, whoever is guiding them, um, as to where to physically move. And what they know when they rehearse is certain combinations, physical combinations, will create certain humorous events. Like, as an example, you'll see if you ever watch the show, you can find them on YouTube. That's sometimes it's actually quite funny where they will get them to move all the way down to the floor or stand up, and they know that these combinations create humor. Also, they also know that the psychology of the participants is that in certain configurations, they're more likely to be led in the right combinations, right? Whether or not the participant realizes this in any way, shape, or form is irrelevant because what in fact is happening is a combination of events that is fully, uh, fully rehearsed. So improv is a very, very, very rehearsed event. And if you've ever done it, th and this is the thing, like, if you have a chance to do improv, um, it, can be a very f it can be a very scary thing at first, but I will say it's really, really fun once you figure out the patterns, because the patterns are really easy to do, and then you can, it's quite a party trick. All right, <clears throat> Steph Curry, one, arguably one of the best basketball players in history. Now, uh, here recently, uh, he is currently trying to break a record for the most consistent three, uh, free throws He's not missed, and I don't know what his number is right now, but at the time of this, it was like 49, right? So he's trying to break this record. Now, they were asking him in an interview, it was like whether or not he was starting to trip him out, and he was like, well, honestly, uh, this past game is the first time I've actually even thought about it, right? I mean, since I haven't missed one, and it's on my mind, I'm going to be more laser focused on the mechanics and the rhythm of shooting free throws until the streak is over. So for anybody who's done a sport of any kind, this, especially with basketball, is it's all about the mechanics of doing it the same way. Get into the habit. Get into the routine. If you've ever done golf or played golf, this is even, the, even more so than anything else, is like the mechanics, the mechanics, the mechanics. And working diligently to get your brain detached from as much of that as possible. The less thinking, conscious thinking you can apply, almost the better, right? Oh, God. Okay. Well, we did our action round early, so we'll, uh, we'll, all, we'll forego an action round today. Okay. So, for the sake of this, what can you do? Uh, and this is a message for not only you as individuals, but definitely for you as leaders of a team or participants on a team. Because I think this is even more valuable in as far as if you have other people, especially if you have newer developers that are joining your team, experience levels, indifferent to experience levels. So, the first is 
to create a routine. So I'll give you an example. So we're a consultancy, and we work with a lot of companies um, that have varying routines. Uh, some of them use particular frameworks or not and what have you. But the one thing that every single company we will work with will start doing if they don't already is they will do a stand-up at 8.30 Pacific time every single day. We just start there. What's in the stand-up is less relevant. Now, I can, there are some things that we do. But what's most important is that there is a stand-up at 8.30 Pacific time every single day. Now, we call this our heartbeat. Now, I imagine many of you do stand-ups as a team. Um, but the more teams that we work with, there's an interesting consistency where we discover that where teams start to ha form dysfunction or dis disassociation within their organization, it is very common to see that specifically the stand-up will be the first thing to go. Right? People coming in late, early, or it just doesn't matter. But the stand-up is a really, really simple routine to do. Okay? Another one is whether we need it or not, we do an IPM at the beginning of every week. The format of an IPM can change. Some people do them with particular card systems. Others do them within their, their uh, planning software. In fact, it's not really that relevant in the grand scheme of things. What's most important is that you do it. That's it, right? So that you have the routine. And similarly, we do a retrospective. Sometimes we change the format of the retrospective. Sometimes we use happy faces, sad faces, question marks. You know, there's all sorts of things you can do. But just the act of doing it is what matters. Now, the combination of these three things, the reason why we've seen value in it, and what routine it forms is it, it, it creates consistency. And consistency creates certainty. And when you as a team have certainty, the feeling of confidence around things is greatly, greatly improved. So if you're working as, let's say, a contractor, you're a solo, uh, solopreneur or whatever, uh, basically working on your own, one of the first things I can recommend is find a routine for yourself that you can practice every single day that is as simple as you can possibly make it, yet maintain it every single day. Okay. So create a routine is one. Then the next is finding a trigger and a reward. So a trigger is basically like an anchor. So imagine, again, like acting where you have a shoulder or whatever, a physical center. The same thing can apply here, where you have a specific event, something that you have total control over, that can trigger the routine every single time. Just like waking up, alarm clock, wake up, shower, breakfast, or what have you, the same thing can be here. But the thing that's often overlooked is the reward. So most routines die because the team forgets or, or loses a sense for what's the positive thing on the other end of it, right? It's routine for routine's sake. It's not really about understanding the whole purpose of doing it in the first place and or the small reward that you can have. So for ours, we've got two. Uh, the first, uh, we have um, one of the, well, one of the triggers is 8.30 Pacific time. That's one. Um, the other one is at the end of every stand-up, we end with one power clap. Right? Seems simple, kind of stupid uh, in the grand scheme of things. But in, in reality, like it's this incredible reward that brings everybody together in that moment. Okay? So a trigger and a reward. St step three is close the presentation and start it up again. Okay. Uh, I've kind of beat this horse to death, but step three is to follow some sort of plan. So if you look at, as an example, when I said we've got you know, I want you to put the editor on the right side of the screen and the terminal on the left side of the screen. Set a timeline and stick to it diligently. Remember that change is a feeling that is not easily overcome. So it's important to get over that hurdle. And so if you give up too soon, you can actually work, it can work against you, right? So when it comes to following a plan, you know, a good timetable, work that out as a team, is at least a week, oftentimes upwards of four weeks, right? So a month or thereabouts. And again, faithfully. Follow it faithfully. Do it. Just consistently do it time and time and time again. All right? Just like with rehearsal as an actor, we do the same thing. We might rehearse a show. It might be, uh, it might be word perfect, and then we'll go right back around and do it all over again. Right? And th that's the reason. Right? You want to follow the plan. Get it really embedded into the body. All right. And number four is celebrate it. And it's celebrate all of it, not just the successes with it. Celebrate all of it. And this is, this is, this is psychological mechanics. So there, uh, there, uh, there was somebody, in, I'm forgetting his name, unfortunately. I'm totally blanking it. But um, he was working to beat the four-minute mile, right? And the four-minute mile had already been broken, but his goal was to, to uh, run a mile under four minutes. He was really struggling. I think he was, he was coming in on average of like four minutes and seven seconds, four minutes and eight seconds, somewhere in that neighborhood. 
And so we had hired a coach that uh, worked with a lot of habits and practices and what have you. And the very first thing the coach did was took him off of the track he was already on. And had taken him out to a track that wasn't even circular. It was one straight mile, right? And uh, so all of this was an immediate change. And when he had run it the first time, he said, the only conditions I have for you is this, that I want you to play full out, do it exactly as I tell you to do it, and celebrate regardless of the outcome every single time. So he goes the first time and runs his heart out, and he came in at over four minutes and 10 seconds. Like it was, again, it was a total shift, total change. Conscious was totally debunked. He had run it at like four minutes, and I think it was four minutes and 13 seconds. And he was totally feeling down. He was like, no, 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 what did I tell you? You play full out and you celebrate. So celebrate. And he's like, give it your all out. And he's like, woo, woo, I failed miserably, right? And he said, OK, so we're going to have you do it again. So he did it again, same outcome, celebrate, right? Has him celebrate again. All right, we're going to take a day, come back tomorrow, we're going to do it again. This time he comes in at right around four minutes and nine seconds. So he's coming close to the time he was consistent with running the track, right? But again, not, not under four minutes, so celebrate. Yeah, OK, and he's starting to wane. So they did this for a period of three weeks. And over that three weeks, at the end, he finally got down to four minutes and one second. Four minutes and one second. And this is when things really started to tank, because it was like, I'm getting so close, but I'm not there. And he goes, OK, well, let's try this again. But this time, I'm going to move the line back. Move the line back? Yeah, so over the course of the three weeks, he'd been moving the line farther. right? So it was more than a mile every single time. So sure enough, he then runs the mile at 3 minutes and 58 seconds. right? Now you can celebrate. right? So the thing to remember in all of this is that if that celebration is a key thing for a lot of reasons, setting aside whether or not the line is moving. But celebration is really important because it does a lot of things in the brain. And one of the most important uh, contributing things is that it opens us up to the possibility that we are, in fact, capable. So where mechanical confidence, in my opinion, does not have to do with purely belief, conscious confidence does. And so to believe in yourself and your ability to consciously be able to do a task does come down to the belief that you can succeed. And so if you create the form of success and the feeling of success, even if you haven't hit the mark you're shooting for, you will, in fact, find yourself progressing further and further down the path and the way that you want to go. So celebration is really, really, really important. So one thing that we often will do with teams, we don't do it every time, but we will do it when things start to wane, is at the end of every workday, we'll institute a show and tell. The the important part about a show and tell is that there is no room for criticism. It is in no way an opportunity for a product owner or a product manager to come in and say, oh, that's all you got done? No, 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 not at all. No, instead what it is, it's an opportunity to celebrate what, what you were able to accomplish, as small or as large as that was. And the same amount of celebration that you have then and something small you get when it's something large. And so you have that feeling every single time. OK. So those are the four steps. So, where does conscious confidence come from? Again, it is, it is a celebratory belief. It's that moment in which you believe that the impossible is, in fact, plausible. That is that moment. All right. Now, uh, last thing is, of course, remember Eugene. Uh, he's a very important figure. Uh, I definitely recommend reading the book, The Power of Habit. And it's not long. It was really um, eye-opening for me that the mind is a very, very uh, crazy thing. OK. Last thing, and then we are good. And if you have a question or two, I can take one. Otherwise, I'll see you out in the hall. Uh, so I would love your feedback. Um, so if you go to mechanicallyconfident.com, it's a simple Google form. And here's what I'm looking for, is especially for those, regardless of how much time you've had either writing software, if you've written it for you know 75 years. There isn't that, but anyway. Um, is that I really want to know what are the things that you do on a day in and day out basis that create confidence in your life, right? What are the things that you are absolutely certain about every single time? That would be conscious confidence. And similarly, I'm going to ask a few questions on that survey about what are things that you do a day in, day out routinely, right? Irrelevant to your level of conscious confidence that you do. Um, and I'm aggregating all that information along with information about, you know, how long of, you know, what, how do you identify your job, you know, either junior engineer or DBA uh, or what have you, as well as, uh, you know, years of experience in doing that. And I'm trying to put together a, a much, much more broader picture on what the Rails and Ruby community looks like when it comes to the topic of confidence. And I hope to have an opportunity to put that out there. So it will be very brief. You're really, really helping me out. But more importantly, you're helping the rest of the community out. 
and I hope it helps you out as well. So please take this time to do that. Um, it would be really helpful. And if this is also something you're able to bring back to your teams, if you're on a team, I would really appreciate that as well. Um, this is not something that's specific just to RailsConf, but it's to teams in general. Okay. All right. Um, the last thing I want to introduce you to is we've got a podcast as a company at Zeal called, uh, it's podcast.codingzeal.com. It's like 20, 30 minute nuggets. So if you kind of have a hard time like shuffling through all of the stuff on the internet that you can read. Um, this is a bunch of engineers talking about engineering like things. Uh, we don't sponsor it or any, like we don't have sponsors or any of that stuff and you're not going to be sold or anything. But it's about 20 minutes or so. Um, so especially if you're new to the industry, this could be really helpful to you. Uh, because we talk a lot about things that are coming up, and as a consultancy, we see a lot of stuff that is coming up because we're, we work with a dozen or more companies every single year, and so there's a lot of change. Uh, so this might be really helpful to you. All right. And that's it. Thank you very, very, very much. Um, I'll take one question. Any one question at all? All right. Excellent. If you have any questions, find me out in the hall. Thank you. <laughs>